Welcome back to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes, and today I'm joined by John Paul Mason, who is drinking from his Jaws mug. Is that a new one, JP? It is a, it is a new one with a biscuit holder. Brilliant. <laughs> Just didn't put a chocolate one in there. It might melt. Um, plenty to catch up on, JP, and you have strategically placed a football jersey behind you due to the fact that Gustav Lagerbilk has signed. Signed on a dotted line. One of the worst kept secrets, but it's good to get this one over the line, JP. It is, and hopefully it um, placates a bit of uh, some of the <laughs> the noise that you've been hearing in the last couple of weeks about uh, people stamping their feet and some of the some of the posts I've read. Oh my word, <laughs> it's unbelievable how much people are losing their mind. And Peter Lawwell, this and oh, it's back to the penny pension days and all this sort of stuff and you're just like whoa calm yep. calm it's no it can't be uh it can't be decided can't be judged until the transfer window slams shut as it always does so um, slam shut i after everybody has been jetted in and then the transfer window will slam shut the thing is jp with that, I, I get, you know what happens, right? I think conspiracies happen be because of a lack of transparency at times, right? So when you are a Celtic fan, you're waiting for news and nothing happens until it's done. Celtic, that's how we do our business. There's no leaks. There's none of that kind of stuff. Preferred uh, pundits, some people think there are. There's, there's none of that, right? Once it's done and it's over the line, Celtic announced the deal. But in the interim, because there's no words coming from the club, People make up their own mind, and that's where the conspiracies come in. So the Peter Lowell conspiracy for me, what I would say to anybody who believes that that's happening and the fact that he's in the building is the reason that the jobs are happening later and longer, it's taken a long time. Brennan Rogers would not be in the building if there was a sniff of that. You know, you imagine the, the meetings that he had with Nicholson and all this, right? This would have all been ironed out. There would have been no interference whatsoever in terms of transfer dealings. I mean, he even mentioned it at his initial press conference, didn't he? Where he? It was with a fan fan media press conference and Rogers spoke about the issue with transfers and the fact that he was being presented with players who were nowhere near the quality he needed. So the one thing yeah. I always say is, you know, Rogers is strong enough, JP, to make sure that that Peter Lowell conspiracy wouldn't happen. That's my belief and, anyway. And, and by the way, if anybody's watching this about to type a comment going, oh, listen to them, they're just, they're, they're Lowell's puppets, he's paid them off and all that stuff. No, I've never received any funds from uh, Peter Law or Glasgow Celtic over my contribution to this podcast. Um, no, that, that's right. So we were we were basically financed by Peter Law. That was one of the theories, wasn't it? Um, yeah. And there's another theory we're financed by somebody else. No, we're not. If anybody does want to finance us and throw some money our way, listen, get in touch. But certainly we're not financed by the club or anyone else. But JP, I think that when you look in isolation, this transfer window, and we're sitting with two weeks to go, we've signed six players now, right? So I think the nature of the buy, there was a good blog yesterday on Axom.net. James McKenzie wrote a blog about it, and it was all around the type of signing. So it was like um, someone who had, you know, potential against someone who was already, uh, you know, known, had a profile. And it was two different types of signing. JP, but I think you get away with bringing in more guys who are signed for their potential when you've got a treble winning side who are successful and who need tinkered with, they don't need completely rebuilt. So I've got no issue with the first four guys that came in. And I've already said on here, I think one or two of them will end up as first picks. You know, at some point in this season, I think we'll be raving about Yang. At some point, we'll be raving about home and even Tilio when he comes in. I'm not convinced from what I've seen with Quan yet, but at the same time, I'm not writing them off. The last two signings, though, uh, the, the two centre halves, Novoski uh, and Lagerbjelk, they do seem like a different type of signing, JP, a different kind of stature of player. Uh, they, they do, yeah. Um, sorry, I'm just getting a phone call from a. Is that Peter? Rental, a rental <laughs> company. Ah, yeah. Pedro. <laughs> mind, mind and keep it positive <laughs> on the signings. Um, no, sorry, that's just throwing me a little bit. Uh, no, the, this, the, the two signs, by the way, I, I feel bad that I didn't pronounce uh, Mike Navrochki's name properly because it's he corrected uh, anybody saying it wrong on, I think it was like an ask, uh, Navrochki, 
uh, questions on the Celtic uh, Twitter and he said it's Navrochki and I should know that given my middle name is Sibulski. So like obviously you've got an SKI, it's Ski, and if you've got a C H C H K I, it's Shki. Right, Navrochki. right, right. Nav- Nav- Navrochki. Yeah. And then he said, but you can call me Rocky if you, if you want. So I, I guess that is his nickname. But yeah, but these signings, I mean, I hadn't heard the Carol Starfelt before he came to Celtic. No. Had you? No, no so absolutely not. I genuinely hadn't heard of him. He came in and despite what anybody said, he played in a very, very successful central defensive pairing with him and Carter Vickers. He wasn't carried by Carter Vickers for the last two years. If you actually believe that, then... I, I don't know what to tell you, but um, so a guy's come in like that who we paid like well north of four million for from yeah it was about um, four and a half yep yeah so mm-hmm. I, I, I'm I'm going to put my faith in the in the scouting system that's currently there and say that Lagerbilk is is surely going to be of good stock and obviously you can never put your house on him being a success at Celtic, but I would say it's more likely than not that he will be, uh, that he'll do well for us. So, mm-hmm. and yeah, he's not a flash name. I don't know him. I'd never heard of him. That doesn't mean to say that he's not going to be good for Celtic, that I would, I would say. And, and same with Navrochki, I, I wouldn't have heard of him before. Definitely hadn't heard of him before. Um, wow, my phone's going wild at the moment. I don't know <laughs> why everyone's decided to phone me. Clearly, n- nobody that watches the Not Celtic Not exactly, aye. aye, 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 aye yeah. um, but uh, in fact, it's my uncle who's probably phoning me to uh, to pull me up on my pronunciation of Sibulski or something like that, because that's <laughs> his surname. But um, I know I, I, the, the players that have come in, I, I mean, I'm not just being like a happy... Oh, God, I'm going to switch this off. I'm not just being a happy clapper. I mean, I genuinely, we've seen who've come in in the last two years, particularly from from uh, Japan. One and a half million for Maeda. Hadn't, well, I had heard of him only through Liam. Uh, and I had yeah. heard of uh, uh, Hitati. Um, Kyogo, I don't know if I had heard of him before he came in. So, <laughs> I mean, just have a little faith. Um, and I'm sure that the, the push strings seem like they're going to be open further in the next couple of weeks before the transfer window closes. Yeah, I think they will be. Um, there's loads of players kind of linked to the club, as you would expect, JP. And there's a few, uh, you know, specifically I want to cover at some point during a conversation. Um, but when you talk about centre-halves and obviously losing Carl Staffelt, who has been part of that successful partnership with Carl Vickers for a couple of years, potentially Carl Vickers being injured, you're then in a situation where... Navroshki, is that right? Just a bit. No, Navroshki. Um, no, ah, okay. Big Rocky. Big Rocky, right? So he, I think, for the first couple of games, has looked really composed. I like his range of passing. Um, I think there was a, a few occasions where he did the old-fashioned kind of sweeper bit, JP, where it looked as though, you know, um, they were getting into the pocket of space behind the, the fullback and he just went over and just cleaned it up. And I love that in a centre half because that's the anticipation to be able to be in that right position so that you're not under pressure, you're not needing that turn of pace, although I do think he's got that. So for me, he's he's looked pretty solid. He would be partnering Carter Vickers um, in an ideal world where everybody's fit, but obviously that might not be the case. When we move into a game like we are this weekend against Kilmarnock, and I believe you've got a ticket for it. Have you got a ticket for that? Ah, right, yeah, yeah. Oh, we nice. got four thousand, so it's not as if we got what we got at Aberdeen on Saturday. Incidentally, I have to pay credit to the Aberdeen home support. I was saying that I hope they turned out in the numbers. It wasn't a full house by any stretch, but it, it was a decent. It was a decent home crowd for the for the first home game of the season, and some questionable chanting aside. Um, it, it wasn't. A, it wasn't too painful to be in amongst them. Uh, on the other side of the divide, um, and also they do a hell of a macaroni and uh, black pudding pie. I have it, never it, experienced that. I have never experienced that, JP. It's uh, it's it's a game changer. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> it's pretty good. Um, but I, uh, but I go back to Kilmarnock. What were you going to say? 
Well, no, what I was going to say there, I was going to interrupt you to say that maybe the, the text messages are coming in from Alan Burroughs saying, remember him, big up your support. And then obviously you've just done that because he was your wee pal, remember, when he was at Motherwell. Mm -hmm. But uh, Kilmarnock, you go into that game, we've now go, we've strengthened the centre-half position further, JP, and, and obviously Lagerbjelk comes in. But how do you start? You know, if, if Carter Vickers is not fully fit, who do you start with? Because I think looking at the, the defensive options that we've got, obviously there's talk now that Lawal's going to Fleetwood Town, he's going to uh, marry up with, with Scott Brown down there and Adam Montgomery's already down there. I think he's he's already signed Scott Robertson, remember, as well on a permanent. So there's a bit of a Celtic contingency down in Fleetwood. Um, and that's the right move for Lawal. He can't be playing, he can't be languishing in the fifth tier of Scottish football next season again. He needs to develop. But then you've got a few other defenders and I guess... The question is, who is the fourth choice? And this is this is how quickly things can turn. The fourth choice will be starting, I guess, against Kilmarnock. Because the fourth choice for me is Stephen Welsh. Kobayashi mm -hmm. and, and Scales, I'm not sure what the future holds for those two or what your view is on that. But going into that game against Kelly, I think we're going to be lining up with uh, Rocky and Welsh. What, what's your thoughts on that? I wouldn't throw in the new guy straight off the bat. Well, I mean, he did play last weekend, but it depends how many training sessions he gets. So mm -hmm. maybe I, to throw him in on that pitch, maybe a bit much. But I guess the manager will know best. But I tell you what, see at half time when the changes were made, I was a little bit nervous about um, Welsh coming in because mm. you just you, you've not seen him for ages. You don't know where his head's at. You don't know how he's been training and all the, all, all the rest of it. So you did kind of feel. Just being in the ground, especially being in the ground and being in the home end, it was. I did. I did get a lot of bit jittery about about the prospect of what they could do to a defensive pairing that haven't played together before. Um, but I have. I have to say, I thought. I thought Welsh did really, really well. In the, he did. In the second. And and the sort of much, not maligned Hitati, but I mean, I thought Hitati in the brief moment that he was on the park. Looked interested, looked up for it. Um, didn't think David Turnbull was anywhere near as bad as people were making out at, at half time. I mean, it's folk pick somebody and then go at them hard, don't they? And they do. Uh, they do. I, I thought for all O'Reilly got the plaudits and he got a goal. I didn't think O'Reilly was, you know, amazing in the game. I thought he was good. I didn't think he was amazing. Um, I think Navrotsky was the the pick of the bunch. I thought he was outstanding in the game. Um, and most people that I spoke to afterwards, like my mates in the car on the way home, it was kind of universal um, in agreement that he was the, the man of the match. Navrochki. There you go. Mm -hmm. Navrochki. Right. So when, when I look at that game, though, JP, and I was going to ask your thoughts on it, I felt it was an, a midfield problem. I didn't think it was a David Turnbull problem because the first half passed Callum McGregor by as well. And you know how mm -hmm. lauded and, and how highly rated he is, obviously, as the club captain. He didn't look great in the first half. What I did think, though, was when Hitati came on, the energy levels completely changed in the midfield, and that's where we started to get a grip of the game. I felt at that point we were in control. I didn't at any point, other than, you know, if someone was to make a horrendous individual error, I didn't feel as though the, there was any question we were going to win the game. And I also mm -hmm. felt in that second half it was about control for Brennan Rodgers. And, and we've spoken a bit about this as well. Control for Brennan Rodgers is managing the game. And if you get that third goal, great. But you know what? If you if you win two one, that's great as well. Poster Coglu wouldn't have had that view, would he? Because he mm. he would want three, four, and five. And I think that's the difference. They're both wanting the same outcome. It's how they get to that outcome. And then you could sit here and probably debate all day long. And you know, if you did a poll on the YouTube, you'd probably get a 50-50 cut on what which you would prefer. I've got to say, I think Rogers' approach, I, I would say this much, JP, you're less likely to throw anything away at the back with Rodgers' approach. And and I think that that's going to fare as well in Europe. It's maybe not as good to watch. I mean, there's definitely an argument for, for both both sides. What I will say is just going back to like last Saturday and the, the atmosphere and even on Saturday and uh, Sunday just there rather, um, obviously I wasn't in amongst the away support, which was kind of weird looking over. Uh, the <laughs> being kind of diagonally opposite the Celtic away support, and, you, and you've done this it. before, haven't you? Where else have you done this? Was it, I did it, it at Abu before, and I did it at yeah. St. Mirren and Hibs, yeah. Um, 
it's quite a it is quite an, an uncomfortable experience. Uh, mm -hmm. At the same time, you're glad you're there. You're glad you're getting to see the game because you, you know as well as I do when you're watching the game on the TV, it's it isn't the same. You, you don't see the movement of players. No. You don't see the body language of players as much. You, there's just so much more you pick up on while you're while you're at the game and um, uh, what I was going to say the the, the atmosphere. I think I've heard a few people say that the atmosphere was a bit weird at Celtic Park, and um, I I just think that there isn't that there's a there's a huge bond that needs to be kind of repaired still. I mean, I'm not saying that it's not by the fact that Brendan Rodgers has come back to Celtic, but I think the more things you see, like a win up at Petardry under mm -hmm. pressure, and Rodgers going over to the support and taking the applause because he obviously was reluctant to do that at Celtic Park. And he did do it on Sunday. Uh, he kind of hesitated, I think. He kind of went and then went, oh, will I do that? And then he went back and, and took the applause and he got he got the applause of the, the away support. So I think the more, I suppose it's like anything, it's like when the team's playing and they get the experience and they get the experience of adversity, going out, losing a goal. Obviously, when um, Majofsky scored for Aberdeen, our backs were up against the wall a little bit and we had to sort of pull something out. Um to get to get uh, get back in uh, in front, so I think the more of that that happens, and the more it's likely that there'll be that connection forms because you've just gone from having like such like one of the strongest bonds I've ever experienced. Well, it is the strongest bond I've ever experienced with a manager. I think because of the adversity that he faced when he came in, mm -hmm. um, I think okay, O'Neill Martin O'Neill was in the argument for what he took over. He took over a Celtic side that was. 21 points or whatever it was behind Rangers at that time. I fully juiced up Rangers machine, EVTs mm -hmm. a lot. Um, Ange Postacoglu took over a team that were a completely a mess, a squad lost, that was a mess. Uh, yeah, they'd lost their way, JP. You know? so, so they'd, they'd had the, success and then they'd lost their way. They were yeah. rudderless. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and uh, everything was pointing towards one, two, three, four years of domination uh, from, from Rangers so I think that was always going to if he was to be successful that was always going to generate a bond but then you've got the whole uh, the, the immigrant um, history of Ange Postacoglu the fact that he was laughed at and a lot of his signings were laughed at so I think you need to, you need you need to give it time before that that bond doesn't just reappear just because of what Brendan Rodgers did in the past you're right. It's yeah. moments like a hard-fought win at an away ground, you know, mm -hmm. where where the chips are down and everything stacked against you, and you pull it out uh, the fire. That it's those moments that then start to, as you say, galvanise that relationship again. And there's going to be moments. I also think where uh, by Rogers used to be a fan and going up to the the, the support with one or two players that he felt maybe had. Uh, played particularly well that day. I remember him doing it with Alston. He'd done it with Tierney. He'd done it with Mikey Johnson, didn't he? Uh, Scott Sinclair, remember, he was being racially abused uh, by mm -hmm. some, and he did it with, with Sinclair as well. I'm going to have a, a shout out here uh, because, you know, often, JP, we talk about the, the kind of toxicity of online and social media and all that kind of stuff, and it's not nice. And then often what happens is someone reminds you of uh, the fact that there's some really, really good people out there. And on Monday, as I was saying, when I went up for a wander around Paradise, um, knock on the, the 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 window of the car, and there's a, a woman there who doesn't want to be named, with a wee envelope for Jamie Tierney. I heard you on the podcast. I want to give you a donation. So Shirt King, whose Twitter at is Shirt King S O E, right? Heard about our shirt in initiative, which is sell the jerseys. We're going to get as many Celtic jerseys as we can. We're going to get them signed up, framed, auctioned, and raffled. He sent us this. Now, as you can see, the actual initials on that it is the one and only. It's incredible. I'm actually holding this. The one and only Tommy Burns. So this was his training top, and this um, collector has seen our appeal and sent that through to the studio and arrived today. Um, unbelievable gesture. Thanks everybody for sending your jerseys in. By this time next week, as I said last week, we're going to have about 100 jerseys in the studio. We're going to keep collecting them, JP. It's not going to stop and then we'll get them auctioned off. We'll get all the cash to Jamie, Jamie's parents. But it just shows you that random act of kindness. Somebody's seen it. And by the way, we didn't follow each other. He's not a Celtic fan. 
It was part of his collection, JP, and he sent it through. How incredible is that? It's great. And just when you heard the picture, the, the top up, I just could picture Tommy Burns. There's a, there's definitely a picture of him standing in that or something very similar right. from the time, you know, just uh, gutting himself laughing on the training ground. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it must have been, you, you know what, you know what, ex football players and managers, uh, patter is like it after dinner speeches and stuff like that, where they, they, they have you, you know, in the palm of their hands for 20 minutes or whatever, where they're just telling you all these stories. And whenever you used to hear Tommy Burns speak, it, you just, it was just amazing to listen to um, his love of the club. And so to be with him on a daily basis, it's no wonder that all the players that got to experience that speak so highly of him um, from when they got, you know, kids like Carl McGregor, obviously, um, knew, knew Tommy Burns and Scott Brown as well. And so these people that were with him day in, day out, what what a guy to be working with day in, day out. So I, that's I a, a great, great gesture. Unbelievable gesture. Um, I had the opportunity just last year to speak to Tommy's daughters, Emma and Jenna, uh, in advance of the Tommy Burns show. And everybody used to speak about how Tommy was always late, late for training, late for everything. And they were saying, it's true, he it was, but a big reason for that was he would never pass you in the street. So if he's walking down the street and a Celtic fan approached approached him, he could have been five minutes away from a very important meeting and he would stand with him and he would talk to them. Were you one of the guys that did that to him? <laughs> no, I'm just thinking that sounds like it sounds like me, but not because people are stopping me because uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm an ex Celtic player and I just I, I was in Edinburgh recently and I, I bumped into like five people that I knew from various different uh, areas of my life. It's just as well I wasn't in a rush to be anywhere because I would have been very, very late if I was because I just kept meeting folk that I just know. <laughs> so I, I, I can I can appreciate that that, uh, that is something that is a, a pitfall of being chatty and whatnot. So. Well, this is the thing as well, JP. Everybody thought they knew Tommy Burns. Every Celtic fan who met him in the street thought they knew him. Tommy obviously took the time to spend with them. Uh, big shout out yesterday in relation to the 83rd birthday of the original Holy Goalie, John Fallon, who obviously sat on the bench at Lisbon and has his uh, Lisbon uh, winner's medal for the victory against Inter Milan. John Fallon turned 83 yesterday, so big shout out to John. He's been on the show. Uh, many, many moons ago was John Fallon on the show in the early days. And we've also got Kevin Willen. Afternoon to you as well, Kevin. Looking forward, says Kevin, to seeing a new Swedish defender in action. Just going to call him Lager. Um, who was it? Was it you that, that said it's like the, the Underworld song that was on Chainspotting? Was it you uh, that said well, that? We were talking about that last week because he was linked last week, wasn't he? He was yeah, already... Yeah. Born slippy. Think first of three or four before the window closes. We had it uh, on decent authority at the beginning of the week that we we're going to bring in four, including this arrival. So another three, I would expect Kevin uh, to come in before the. I think it's the first of September, isn't it? Or is it the midnight? Is it mm. midnight going from the thirty first into the first before oh. that window slams shut? Um, David Boyle, uh, a regular contributor to the show, welcome. You are commenting on YouTube if you want to make a comment and get involved in the chat. All you need to do is subscribe free of charge to the YouTube channel. After John firmly corrected me on Fraser yesterday, that's Ryan Fraser, the Podens talk is a much better upgrade if we pull off. That leads us into a completely different discussion then, uh, JP, because obviously when a particular manager comes in, I think we've seen it with Ronnie Dyla, We've certainly seen it with Vim Janssen, we've seen it with Martin O'Neill, and we definitely saw it with Ange Postacoglu. They shop in a certain market that they know pretty well. And so when Brennan Rodgers comes in, I think when people are saying, is that a Rodgers signing? It's probably because that he's not um, existed within the market that the players come from. You know, he's not he's not managed in Sweden, for example, or in Poland. But, you know, where he has managed, or Brazil, or Argentina for wee Bernabe. Uh, <laughs> yeah, aye, exactly. <laughs> so th there's been a few links to EPL players, uh, and one of those players, obviously, is is the 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 chap that you, that David mentioned there, Daniel Podence. And I think when you look at him as a player, the uh, transfer fee involved, and and bringing a player like that to the club, I think he went to Wolves for something like sixteen million quid. 
JP, they wouldn't be getting that money back for them, certainly. The other players that have been mentioned, Derek Dyer, Ryan Fraser, these are players that are playing in the EPL, getting EPL wages. Are we linked to them because it's lazy journalism? Is there any truth in the story? Is it down to an agent throwing a few names about to try and get bids in for their players? Is there any truth to it? Do you think Brendan would be an interested in that type of player? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I did something that I don't normally do, and I watched some because I didn't. I don't know about this guy. I mean, I, I man, I don't really watch English football as much as I used to. I think it's mainly due to the eye-watering levels of money that are that's sloshing around down there now. And incidentally, speaking of that, I can't believe that Neymar is going to be on two and a half million pounds a week. And then I read a list of all the the things that uh, that he's going to get while he's there, as if he needs it. But like, it's like helicopter this, and uh, any time he posts about Saudi Arabia, he gets like five hundred grand. I or read something. that. It's absolutely insane. Like, but he's I, a puppet if he does that. You know, post something positive about Saudi, and we'll give you half a million quid. I mean, where's his morals? Well, where, where's the, the morals of football? They don't exist. I mean, then people will point to us and be like, oh, you were happy to take £25 million pounds of it from uh, Al Wettihad for, for Jota. But I mean, that's not really in our control as a as a, as a, as a fan base. I, I, I just can't believe it's going on. It's, it's too it's, it's, it's too much, man. It's been it's been too much for a long, long time. But um, I just I just despair at this uh, levels of money that's been it's been spent now it's gone way beyond <laughs> what I ever ever thought as a wee guy you know when Andy Cole was signing for like nine million or whatever and you know, it's, it's right. just like, like that that like surely it's never going to get to like 50 million that's long gone if, you know <laughs> middle middle to bottom clubs in England could probably spend that on a player now as it's incredible to- and it's out of control and it's interesting that you mentioned Cole because obviously that was one of the massive buys down south so Mm. it reverberated even if you weren't an English football fan you knew about that transfer and the reason that's quite um, fresh in my mind is I was just I was writing the other day about the aforementioned uh, late great Tommy Burns signing Pierre Van Hoydonk from NAC Breda Um, and he cost us 1.2 million quid but the deal was 1.5 300 grand went to Van Hoydonk it was a big signing for Celtic no the biggest signing our record at that point was Phil O'Donnell 1.75. 1.75. But on the day we signed Van Hoydonk, Alex Ferguson signed Andy Cole for Manchester United. And you'll remember it was a £7 million deal, but that included Keith Gillespie, who went yeah. the other way. He I went the other way. And I remember looking at that £7 million, And then I think after that, the one that shocked me with the, the price of it down south was probably Shearer to Newcastle for £15 million, Right? Mm-hmm. And then it just started getting out of control. I was out of control at that stage. And Burns was talking about the reasons behind buying Van Hoydonk at that stage. Obviously, he was was a class goal scorer. He had scored more than 20 goals in the last three seasons for a a bottom kind of half um, Dutch side, NAC Breda. And when we bought bought him, other clubs that were interested included Feyenoord, Borussia Dortmund and Chelsea. Now, we couldn't, you know, fast forward to now, we couldn't compete if those three clubs were were looking to sign a player right now. Tommy was asked about the fact that we were signing an overseas player, which was quite unusual. I'll tell you how unusual it was, JP. In the previous 30 years, we had signed six overseas players. Six in 30 years. And it's guys like Rudy Vata had been the most most recent one at that time. Prior to that, Darius Dovcek, Darius Jakinowski, Prior to that, Johannes Edvaldson. Uh, there was two goalies, one called Leif Nielsen and one called Bent Martin, uh, who was Danish. I think he played for maybe Aarhus. So we had signed six overseas players in 30 years. We signed Van Hoydonk and then all of a sudden it opened the floodgates because you now look at since that, that moment, we've signed players with more and more regularity from all over the world. Now, I think there's pros and cons to it, but when Tommy Burns was asked, why there's, there's pros and cons because I think it affects the youth development of, of our own academy players. Burns was asked why he did it. He says it's the only way we could afford a player of that calibre because mm-hmm. we, we've got to go to these other markets. If we signed Van Hooydonk, 
from a, a team in England, it would have cost double the amount. It would have cost even three million quid, he says, you know, three and a half million quid. So you could understand why we're doing it and we're still doing it to this day, aren't we? Uh, with players, right. we're, we're going into these markets because they're cheaper. Well, the, the Podence thing is, um, it, I mean, he's sort of fallen out of favour, isn't he? It's, it's one mm. of these classics. He wasn't included in the pre season trip, uh, so wasn't in that squad against us. Um, probably now that they've named like their squad for the season or whatever it is, I don't know how that works down there, but um, he's surplus to requirements. So it's a, 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 if we do get him, it would be a classic case of guy whose career's gone a little bit awry in England, but is still very, very good and would be very good at, at our level. Um, and I did watch, I did watch a YouTube compilation of him because I thought. Right, if we're going to go and spend serious money on this guy, I, I kind of want to see what he's about, and it looks pretty good. Um, I mean, I, I you never ever or not, should never ever base your full sort of um, uh, prediction on 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 a guy's YouTube reel, but I mean, got good feet, both feet, um, can finish, is is quite well built as well. Um, he's not. Like a wee, a wee guy on the wing, you know. He's, he's mm -hmm. he looks, mm -hmm. looks a, a bit of a unit. So I don't know. I'm quite exciting to think that 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 that's a potential. I'm sure. Well, not I'm not sure. We were talking about the potential of Lager Bielk last week, and now yeah. he's in the door and was pictured in a Celtic jersey yesterday. James will be speaking to him at the press conference today, and mm -hmm. he's. That at a week's time we're not sitting going. I mind how last week we were talking about Podence and now he's here. So exactly. Now there's a few things in there. Firstly, yeah, you're right. James McKenzie is going to be up at Celtic Park in a couple of hours speaking to the new signing. Fair play to him. I mean, a young, a young guy, James's age. If I was that age, GP, I would be probably a bag of nerves to go up to Celtic Park and sit in that press room and either speak to a new signing or the gaffer, which James has done this season. He spoke to Brendan Rogers as well. But I think it's interesting that we're, we're linked to a player and the first question I would ask you is, yeah, I'm excited as well. You know, we're very fickle as football fans, you know. He's more of a, a player with a bit of a profile. I think he comes with um, quite a high calibre and a good reputation, but he's obviously a talented player. Out of favour otherwise, we probably wouldn't be in a discussion. And I think no. as Celtic fans, we realise that as well. Sometimes you've got to buy no damaged goods in terms of like injured players, but guys who need a, a, an arm round them. You know, the Sin Sinclair type first time round for Rogers. What what we did or what Rogers did with, with him was unbelievable. He knew the talent the boy had from a young player, and he knew he could he could draw on that and bring it out of him. And he performed brilliantly under Brendan Rogers. Yeah, I think he would be a, a great signing. The first question I'm going to ask you, though, JP, do you think we need another winger? Because I was banging the drum about the fact we needed a left winger. That was one of the positions that I thought we still needed to strengthen. But I think I've been converted a wee bit, probably by Jared of Celtic Down Under, who assures me that Tilio is as much a left winger as he is a right winger. I then see Yang. I've seen, I was impressed with him on the right-hand side. I then see what he can do on the left-hand side. So I think behind Maeda, and of course you've got Haksabanovic, James Forrest, Mikey Johnson as well, who can all play there. I'd be surprised if we needed a left-sided winger. You look on the right-hand side, what have you got there? You've got Abada. You've obviously got Yang, Tilio, Forrest as well, who can all play on the right-hand side. And I'm wondering, do you need a winger? What's your thoughts on that? I, I wonder if one of, one of them might depart. Um, I mean, the Mikey Johnston thing, he's out injured for months. So mm -hmm. I don't think we could really be even talking about him in the, in the equation in terms of being... A, a, a person in line because he's not in line at all at the moment. He's he's laid was laid down again, which is unfortunate for him. But it's no time doesn't he stand still. <laughs> you know we need to we need to tool up. We've got the Champions League coming, and we need yeah. Champions League. Not not necessarily Champions League players, i.e. players that have played week in week out in the Champions League. But we need guys that we know we can trust and we can rely upon. Haksabanovic, I would wonder if. His his foot is out the door. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I just I don't really get the vibe that Brendan Rodgers rates him or is into him. Um, 
I mean, and we've, we've spoken about him as well as being like a guy that is a, almost a bit of a nearly man in terms of like what he, what he can do. You can see that there's something there, but it's just mm-hmm. it's just not, we've not had so many. Yeah, he scored a few goals, no doubt, but I think in the big games, he's been found wanting a little bit and uh, he just seems to be a bit out of the picture and if there's a conversation being had about what his future is going to be at Celtic, I'm speculating, I've got no idea, but I just think that if if we are looking at somebody else like uh, Podens, then someone will probably go. And I think, yeah, there'll be, there, there, there's, there's no way that there's not going to be a couple of other outgoings from that first mm-hmm. team squad. Mm-hmm. Um, hopefully not ones that we will shed tears over, i.e. Hitachi or, uh, you know, potentially a, a badder as well. I mean, I, I, I know I know there's now chat of him signing a new deal and all the rest of it, but he continues to be linked to clubs. So um, I think that I think there will be movement out the way as well as as well as in the way. So I think they'll, they'll, if we are linked with, if we are serious about Podence, then I think then there'll be somebody that will go to, you know, make way for him. A couple of things on that. I never mentioned Rocco Vata, and I think very much he is a first-team player. But like Boston Lawal, who's already had the first-team experience last year, I think Vata needs to go out on loan for a season. So that's maybe why I didn't I didn't mention him. On Hak Stanovic. I was going to say, I Rocco. saw Vata on Saturday. I went to the, uh, the B-team game. Uh, um, the, uh, can't remember, the Christy Gillis Park in Muir House. Me and my mate Michael went. <laughs> just a very random thing. I was going through Edinburgh anyway to see uh, to my, my my old flatmate's fortieth, and uh, I thought, I wonder where the B team are playing. So we just looked it up and we paid at the gate, eight pound to get in. It was only maybe old about, school. F- ah, it was about fifty or sixty people there or something like that. And what delicacies and, uh, were on offer? Um, at, at the, the, is it the Christie Gillis Park? What, not, what not, nothing. Nothing. Nothing on the level of a macaroni and black pudding pie at Petodre, I'll tell you that for nothing. Uh, we did we did get a pie, uh, but I, w- I watched Vata and he scored and he he, he, did, he did look a class above a lot yeah. of the guys on the pitch. You could tell, but there was there was a, lo- a lot of the players in the Celtic side were not at the level that you would maybe hope that they were at. I mean, we got we got beat three one, <laughs> we got beat three one off a team of. I don't know who those guys, what those guys do, but they've obviously got jobs or whatever. They're not mm-hmm. playing mm-hmm. full time for for that football team. Um, but he took his goal well, and he definitely um, has something about him. There's no doubt about it. When you see someone that close up, there's a difference there, and you can see why he's been linked with other clubs. But how do we go? But from getting him, you know what? Why was it? Why did Kieran Tierney? How did Kieran Tierney get a direct pathway into the first team and nail down a position and keep it? No one else has really <laughs> done that. No, since then. and and by the way, right? I think you you give the club credit for trying to get a pathway because obviously when we got the B team into the the pyramid, uh, JP, it wasn't because we wanted them to always play in the fifth tier of Scottish football. We did it with a view to you get that bedding in period. This is the agreement, which is a short term one. This is season number three. Still no promotion. Big kickback from all other teams. They don't want Celtic to have a B team that progresses through the league pyramid and all that. So I think the intentions were right. But like you've said there, you've got two situations. You've got guys who are playing at a level and they're they're miles off ever being a first team player if they're playing at fifth fifth tier uh, Scottish football. You've got guys who uh, like Rocco Vata who are clearly better than that level, but there's nowhere else for them to go in terms mm-hmm. of the progression, the gateway, the pathway. Uh, and therefore, what you need to do is try and find a, a loan deal that suits the player, where there's maybe a club with a, a similar philosophy and style of football, because you don't want to just send them to a defensive club, because he's not going to star for them. We've seen that so, so often. And I think that's mm-hmm. where the, the the loan market and all that kind of stuff is something that's very intricate. You know, A lot of players' careers could be ma- you know made or broken by a good or bad loan deal. We've seen some good loan deals where I think Chris Iyer, Callum McGregor, Ryan Christie, it all worked out for them and it was great for them. But, you know, that's, what, three? Tell me if there's any more. That's three 
over a period of, say, 10, 15 years, JP, and we're loaning a dozen, sometimes 20, if you look back through the records, young guys out to clubs all over Europe. So I, I feel for the club in, 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 on one hand, there's nowhere else to put these young guys. On the other hand, the player might get bored. How many have we lost? You know, uh, to bigger, I say bigger clubs, richer clubs, um, who have got a system whereby even at the under-23 league down in England, JP is going to be of a, a, a vastly superior level to fifth-tier Scottish football. And if you get the opportunity, not only to get a bigger wage by going down there, but to get a bigger challenge and a better challenge and develop as a footballer, then you're not going to stagnate. So, yeah, we're in a situation where I feel for the club because there's very little we can do at the moment. I think partnerships are great. Uh, we've heard about Admira Wacker. If you've got a few partnerships with clubs that you can work hand in hand with, I remember back to who was the team? Was it Uspes Dosha, where where Willie McStay went over to to Hungary? He was oh, employed yeah. by Celtic. He was employed by Celtic, but he went and worked in Hungary for this team. And there was a tie-in, and the, I I spoke to Willie about that when he came to the studio, and there was a tie-in whereby we were meant to be sending him three or four really really useful, potentially good kids a year. He got one, and all the time he was there, he got one player a player called Mark Miller. So it didn't work. The idea was there, but the club has to follow it through. Um, and if they don't, then we'll continue to lose uh, the young players. A couple of things. The, the first one on Haksabanovic. I think that I can think in moments that um, Jota, uh, Maeda and Abada, many moments that were game-changing moments against big clubs at, at important times that all those players made. Someone might pitch and say, I well, Haksabanovic had against Dund Dundee United last November. If you're going to be a winger at Celtic, you're going to have to have game-changing moments throughout the season. If, you, if you're going to be someone who's actually going to contribute to the to the, the way the club plays. I think we're deploying the, the wingers slightly differently now, JP. It seems to suit Maeda. It, it's suiting Abada, because I think both of them have, have performed really well. Some disagree with me on the Maeda point, but it's no suit to Haksabanovic, because he got game time during pre-season and he looked like a uh, you know, what is it, a fish out of water? I was going to say a duck out of water. That's a different saying. A fish out of water. Um, they're, they're going to be coming in a lot more. It's not something that Poscoglu didn't do. How often did we see Jota cutting in and striking it? All the time. But largely the, the role of the, the winger was to hit the, the byline and get, you know, a, for, a front post cross. Kyogo would dart in, a batter would ghost in at the back. And we would score a lot of goals uh, through that move. It's changed a bit. We're using the, the wingers differently. It doesn't suit Haksabanovic. It's as simple as that, JP. So I think he will move from the club. Uh, the other thing I was going to say to you is, is moving into um, a Monday morning where I took my wonder round paradise. Start start my, my week off with a bit of exercise and fresh air. And obviously a visit uh, to the Blessed Stadium. And I'm walking around. And when you walk around the stadium, there's nobody kicking about. There's a wee guy on a trolley, who's getting all the stuff from the weekend and putting it over on the refuse tips and all that stuff. A couple of people walking their dog and there's a few cars darting about. But, it, you know, it's a, it's a different world to match day. But it gives you time, JP, to look about the place and say, oh, wow, you could use that bit there for a fan zone. Or, you know, it'd be great to have a band stand there and big murals doing the, the, the breeze block walls. And you start kind of dreaming up all these amazing things that could happen, some of them pie in the sky, some of them that would probably work. And it takes me on to the, uh, the fact that a couple of the upcoming games at home have sold out well in advance against, you know, the big kind of opposition you would expect. What's the big games? Hibs, Hearts, Rangers, Aberdeen at home, other than the Champions League. So you've got Dundee and St. Johnson. Maybe historically they wouldn't sell out. Certainly not this far in advance, but they have. It shows that, you know, that there, there is an appeal to coming to Celtic games, obviously but the stadium is selling out time and time again. And there's a discussion at the moment online about increasing the capacity. Now, there's obviously a lot of drawbacks to doing that. Short-term or medium-term drawbacks in that you've got to close the main stand to redevelop it. Where do you put all the people that are in the main stand at the moment when you've not going to have enough seats to put them anywhere? Um, obviously, there, there's various things that we've done in the past. Remember the temporary stand um, as part of the reconstruction of the stadium? Oh yeah, that, that was the, the black fast days. Right? Yeah, yeah. I remember. It could, surely it was online or maybe only on a forum. I'm not sure where, but temporary stand CSC was the avatar name of somebody. You know, um, so they were obviously stuck stuck in the tem temporary stand. So there's the whole logistics around how you would do it. Uh, and another argument that that many people have made is that 
would it be worth it? Because, and I guess this is why it's came into the discussion again, JP, would it be worth it? Because how often would you sell it out? And I think it's unexpected that we've probably sold these two fixtures out so early uh, that it's brought it back into the discussion. Where do you stand on it? Because I, I just think that when McCann built a 60,000 all-seater stadium, which cost 26 million quid, and at that time, we didn't have the finance for it. And if you go back into the prospectus, um, obviously that gets sent out to the shareholders year on year, McCann explained that this is the plan, but we're going to be doing it in stages because we actually don't have the money to do it right now. And it was during the share issue, which raised 20 mil, £21 million pound of the £26 million pound we needed. So we're obviously five short. And he also had to pay off the overdraft that he inherited from the old board, which was £5 million. So we were £10 million short, plus the Celtic fans were demanding that we buy players so that we beat Rangers and stop 10 in a row. So th there was a real issue in it, but the vision of Fergus McCann at that time was unreal when you think about it. If you looked at the average attendances for the last 15, 20 years, nobody would say, ah, you should go and build a 60,000 stadium, but he did it anyway. And we've now got, what, 54,000 season ticket holders in that stadium. So there's a wee bit of that, there's an element of that, JP, where I still think we're Celtic. We should have an 80,000. But then I've been hearing that even if we did, because obviously feasibility studies and all that has happened. This has been in the mix for a long time, as has the museum and everything else, right? If they were to to build it up to the kind of same level as the other three stands at Celtic Park, it wouldn't increase the, the capacity to 75 or 80,000. It wouldn't increase the capacity by a great deal. So the cost mm. doesn't really make sense when you look at how long it would take to pull that cost back. What's your take on it? My OCD says we do it because I don't like the fact that that main stand is lower than the other three. Uh, I also think if you had that bowl and it was all at the same level, an already incredible atmosphere would be taken up a level as well. Mm -hmm. It certainly would. If, if, but how would it not increase the capacity then if, if, if you did? Well, you know, the camber, the camber of that, that main stand is completely mm -hmm. different from the other stands in and around it. So mm -hmm. if you were to, to like even it up, and there would be a corporate element to it as well. Um, I think the capacity um, would be something like 68,000 if you were to make that stand. So in your mind, you think, all right, you make that stand the same, it's going to take it to X, Y, or Z. It would increase it, but not to the 75 or 80 that you might mm -hmm. expect. You would need another tier on top of one of the stands to make that happen. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I mean, that's... So, aye. So you need another tier on top of the main stand, is, is what you're saying? Yeah, you would, you would have aye. like one big main stand that was not not tiered. Aye. Okay, I get I get what you mean. I mean, I, obviously, if it has been, there's been if there's been feasibility studies and things like that, then they'll have ruled a lot out, and they'll have a, a column that set a column of possibilities of what they can do with it, and mm -hmm. maybe maybe one day way into the future <laughs> when we're gone that, that 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 might be a thing um it certainly wouldn't be something that i'd be looking to prioritize right now i mean the idea of it sounds great and everything else but i think our priority right now should be getting things right uh on the park and and doing things elsewhere that we could you know monetize whether that is the much mm -hmm. Uh, vaunted hotel and museum. I mean, there is, like you said, you've walked about the place, there's space to have things. I'm sure Glasgow City Council would uh, get involved in, in, in obstacles for, for anything like that, and there'll be red tape and everything that you'd have to cut through to, to be able to do things. But, yeah, I think that the stadium idea, whilst it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a kind of fanciful idea, it's not something that I would be pushing for. Obviously, it's great that matches like home are selling out. Uh, I'm going to miss the uh, St. Johnston game. I'm absolutely gutted. We're going to be one game down on the season already. The, I made I made 22 out of 38 league fixtures last season, which was all right considering I was away for a bit of that time. But um, yeah, I'm working a festival, Connect Festival. Uh, oh, there's a, there's always a good reason for it. Jay. Some people no, may no, say that. No, I know, but it's just it's, it's frustrating. I do try and try, I try to sort of plan my life around 
music and, and football and I've got no choice. I can't just leave in the middle of the day a festival that I'm working that I'll be starting at probably eight or nine in the morning and finishing at you know, midnight, one o'clock. I can't just sort of be like, oh, I'm just away to Celtic game. <laughs> I'll be back in a couple of hours. Um, well, they'll but, understand because all the, all the cool musicians are Celtic fans anyways. So they, they will understand, JP. But that, that takes us on to the other discussion. People are saying, listen, we probably don't need it right now. It would, it would look great, yes, uh, for half a dozen games a season it would sell out. But people are saying about a, a ticket buyback scheme whereby those two games we've mentioned, there are going to be many fans, not just yourself, who for a number of reasons won't be able to attend the game. And it's about saying, well, you know what, I can't go to that St. Johnson game. You go into your account online, it's available. So the game's sold wow. out. Oh, wait a minute, there's, there's 2,000 available now. You know what I mean? So that would be a good system. A hundred percent. I can't believe that. that if, they're, if they're talking about uh, doing things other other than extending the stadium, that should be on the list of things to do to maximise the attend the actual physical attendance that's in the ground, so mm -hmm. that you don't have those those um, spare seats. There should there should if a game is sold out, there should be no seat empty. Uh, no, so, I mean my my seat. What I will give my ticket to. Um, probably Sean behind me usually brings one of his uh, his kids or, or a mate or something like that. I mean, we've all we've all sat together for ten years now, so um, my ticket won't go to waste. I would never. I do everything I can to make sure somebody's right. sitting in my seat. If I'm not at that game, I don't I don't want it sitting empty. Um, just because I feel like it's not only am I not going myself, then I'm not getting somebody to 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 sit in my place and shout nonsense that I would shout normally. <laughs> um but uh, yeah no, I, 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 I think yeah I think I think it's 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 not it's not a priority for me. No. Now listen I'm 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 totally aware of the fact that uh, I've not got as many comments in as possible because uh, as always on a Thursday JP you and I just go on a wee tangent and before you know it it's uh, 10 or 9 minutes to the end of the show Ridiculizer is in on the chat though uh, Porins doesn't really fit the transfer model and I get that because you're going to be having to to up your game in terms of the transfer fee to get them in the building um also I've got big concerns about the three players from the EPL and the wage structure uh, and I don't think it fits that either. Do we need a statement signing? You know, that that's a discussion that could uh, rage on all day. Paddy Lavery, always an absolute pleasure. Paddy has also gotten on the act and sent us a jersey as well. Sean Fitzgerald, hi lads, and hail, hail from Kerry. My birthday today, can you give me a shout out? Sean Fitzgerald, happy birthday to you. And plenty of people in the comments section are saying the same. I'd sing your song, uh, but I'd Probably best not to, because you've heard my demos from the 1990s, JP, and I'm not the best chanter. I thought your, uh, next, I thought your next line there was going to be, I'll sing you a song of a terrible wrong. <laughs> um, that's another you have podcast. heard my demos, haven't you? Aye, that is another podcast. Aye. You and Boy Martin, great to hear from you as always. I spoke to you at the Roy Aiken gig. It was great to see you're looking well. Uh, for Champions League, top priority, we need left back. I agree with that. Powerful number six or eight. Apparently, we, we're looking at that. Plus, we need a goalie. Yep. Striker and a left winger. I've spoken about those two positions. I'm not sure we'll go for them. I think Brennan will get these players. Um, with regards to the striker then, going on to the fact, obviously, O's injured, uh, JP. We're going into the game against Rangers on the 3rd of September, potentially, without O, Carter Vickers, Hatati, Johnson, potentially, uh, as well as uh, the departed Moy, Jota and Starfield. I, I was talking about this yesterday because when you look at that, I know O wouldn't have been a starter, but potentially the, the other six would have been if all mm -hmm. fit and all at the club, obviously. Does that concern you? Because the, the one thing that makes me a wee bit more confident is the fact that we've got Brendan Rodgers. I've got a huge amount of trust in the fact that, you know, by that time, uh, you know, and I know it's only two weeks and a bit away, um, we will be in better shape. The Carter, Carter Vickers missing would would be a huge blow. I mean, everybody knows how good he is in any game, never mind games against them. And I, I certainly wouldn't want to be going into that game without him. I think it would be it'd be pretty it'd be pretty unfair, really, on 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 the way things have started this season to to go in without our arguably one of our best players, if not our best player. Uh, the others. Yeah, not having the backup for Kyogo if something was to happen to him and 
let's face it, given the size of some of the players they've signed, something might happen to Kyogo, um, whether it's accidental or not. Um, but I'd, I would hope neither of that happens. But uh, it, it's, it's one of those things you can't really legislate for picking up an injury at Pataudry on Sunday, um, Hatati as well. I did like what I saw of home when he came on. I thought he looked really, really good. Um, just thought he looked really calm on the ball. and He's really he composed, eh? Yeah, it was one point where he took the ball down and you were expecting him maybe to stop and put his foot on it and make a pass. But he took the ball, he brought the ball down out of the, out of the sky and then just took a touch and, and then started running with it. And I was mm-hmm. like, wait a minute, this is no, he's not a normal normal signing. This is this is somebody that's got something about him, clearly. And uh, wasn't he too fond of his post-match uh, social media post? Um, I'm, I'm not a fan of that kind of that kind of chat that that can that can uh, remain elsewhere um, on these shores. I just don't, I think hopefully somebody pulled them up about it and just said get rid of that. Must have done. They must have it's done. Just, it's just, I know he's a wee guy. I know he's twenty. I know he's in a new country. He's trying to impress, and obviously that you think to yourself, what would you do if you were a Celtic player and you had an Instagram account, and and then you see that picture. He's probably going, all right, I'll just put some song lyrics to that. But it just didn't, it didn't sit well with me. So I hope, I hope that's the first and last of it from him because you just, you just like to see players do their talking on the pitch. And he certainly did that on Sunday. But to do it after as well was a bit kind of, was a bit tasteless. Um, but I, I, love, as for- I love the old school. The old school rivalries are better. You know, ones that they do, as you say, it happens on the park. Uh, and, yeah. and you know, they come off that part. Again, Aiken spoke about it with regards to the situation with McGee in the in the 83 Scottish Cup final where McGee gets Aiken sent off and Strachan's part yeah. of the racket as well because he's up at Bob Valentine telling him to send them off. But yeah. these guys were all were all mates. You know, Strachan and Aiken yeah. played international football together. McGee was one of his best mates. Uh, they ended up doing it at Newcastle together after the days at Celtic. He says, but on the park completely different gravy you know once you cross that wine line white line it's just battle you would you would do anything to get the win uh for or against I, I i prefer that and in recent times what we had it we've had it with sean uh sorry scott brown up at aberdeen there was a few players didn't like bruni and he knew it and he played on it and that's fine and then obviously the crack on the park against rangers with bruni and various players i, I much prefer that than any of the social media stuff that's just my take on it it's always going to exist and you know, if you're going to put yourself up there, you're going to have to take it back oh, if you're not doing so well. I know. I, if uh, if I could have replied with a gif, it would have been uh, the Roy Keane's face, just kind of like going, you know, <laughs> did you see Roy Keane with Daniel Sturridge the other day when ah, James Daniel was showing us up? Just like standing there going, oh, what is going on here? We're talking about football and you are singing. Like, like, come on now. I know. He <laughs> just brings everything back down, doesn't he? People, people would then maybe throw that back at us and be like, oh, this is supposed to be about football and you just talk about music. And it's like, oh, well, okay, well Paddy Lavery believes that a Thursday isn't a Thursday without J.P. Mason. Um, and yeah, it's always great. But obviously, where you work, there's going to be a spell later on in the year, J.P., where you won't be available, you'll be elsewhere. Uh, but yeah, Thursday is a Thursday. It's J.P. and P.J., <laughs> if you want to do that. And it's Michael Ross, left-back keeper and a striker. The striker one, I just think it comes home to the fact that uh, all it takes is one injury to someone like O. But I also think that Maeda and Abada have shown that they can play up top as well. And you've got that obstacle with a Yeti. No, we don't want him to play. I've seen that comment last week. We're no, we're no saying that he needs to play the game. But he's an obstacle because he's on a decent wage, right? And I think the board will be saying, we'll bring a striker in once we get him off the off the books, JP. I think that's what it comes down to. Aye, yeah, I mean, people were commenting saying, oh, what are you talking about, uh, a Yeti? I was only saying to use him if we if we need to use a player, why would you why would you like be shoehorning a midfielder up front or something like that if you've got a fit guy who's a striker who hasn't been given an opportunity? If he's if he has a bad smell around the training ground or has been insolent in any way, then of course you know get him out of the club as soon as possible. But we've got no evidence that he has been that. I've not 
heard anything concrete to suggest that he's um, been out of line at, 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 the, at the training ground or at Celtic in general. I just, he's not, he's not like done anything bad. Like he's just, he's just not been very good as a football player for Celtic, and he's draining a lot of money every week in wages. No doubt. I mean, we don't know that for fact. Yeah. But I mean, signing a guy for five million, he's not in two grand a week. Do you know what I mean? No, um, no. It's like I was surprised with Bernabe's wages when he appeared at court last week. You know, five grand a week. But yet he was signed from the EPL, and he had signed for West Ham. For over was it eight or nine million quid he'd signed for West Ham. So whatever wages he was on down there, you're probably looking at 30, 35 grand. He's come up mm-hmm. here, he's taken a cut, but he's not down at 10 or 15 grand. You know, he's he's on big mm-hmm. wages. I get that the player might want to just sit out his contract, JP. We gave him the contract, we need to suck it up. But mm-hmm. at the same time, I just think any footballer that takes six months, never mind a year or whatever, out of competitive action is doing themselves some damage. Now, there's a wee comment in there about Lee Griffiths. I'm not going to labour anything else about social media, but what I would say about the Lee Griffiths thing, I don't know if you watched that interview that that appeared on a pod on YouTube during the week there, JP, and he's talking. There's a few interesting wee bits about it, actually. Um, He's talking about, you know, the fact he's over in Australia now. He's playing a very kind of lower standard of football, but he's enjoying his life. He's got a couple of his kids out there and, and, you know, family time and all that's improved and all that, you know. I think he was in a situation here in Scotland where a lot of things weren't kind of going his way, not just on the football park. But there's a couple of really interesting things and he opened up about the fact that Brendan Rodgers, watch it, I wouldn't ruin it, but there's a moment where Brendan Rodgers uh, shows his kind of humanity and his man management skills when Griff is at, is at his absolute lowest. He's actually in hospital um, and he opens up a wee bit about that. But there's also an interesting situation where he's talking about Bruni, whereby Lee Griffiths and Bruni travel together to the stadium and training and all that. And obviously they had shots about. So when Lee Griffiths eventually got a driver's license, he took some of the driving uh, duties and he's going to pick Bruni up for training. And Bruni's hanging. He's absolutely hanging because he's been on it the night before. And obviously everybody's laughed at us. But I'm sitting going, wait a minute, this is a captain of Celtic. Turning, for, turning up for training, hung over, JP. So we talk about role models, we talk about this, we talk about that, because apparently after a coffee and a look aid, Bruni was right as rain and he was ready to go. But, you know, sometimes you think that these players are robotic, they're like machines. But when you see under the bonnet, it's not quite like that, is it? No, nah, of, of course players are going to... I mean, that, I'm sure Bruni's going to be delighted that that's been put into the public domain. Um, I don't. Uh, cheers, cheers, Lee. Cheers, I, uh, I, I, it wasn't bad enough getting pictured sitting outside the kebab shop uh, in the grass market or wherever it was. Kebab, um, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, players are going to like let loose every now and then. You, you've got like the ultra professionals who just probably don't drink at all and therefore don't put themselves in situations like that. But there's no way you're going to tell me that a professional football player doesn't like. To have a swaldo of a, of an evening, especially if, if well, maybe not with a day of training the next day. That's that's a different kettle of fish. I don't know if I'd fancy training on a, after a heavy night out because you must like doing like bleep tests and all that kind of thing. That would not be fun if you're uh, if you're hanging. But what do you think? Like you're James McKenzie. James McKenzie got out of his bed at three o'clock in the afternoon after a couple of swallows during the week. And you think to yourself, <laughs> turning up for training at nine o'clock, I just couldn't do it, JP. Sit on a personal level, my, I physically <laughs> could not do it. So fair, but I think it says loads about Bruni, but you're right. You'll be texting Lee Griffiths and saying, mate, I'm a manager. I'm, I'm meant to be a role model. And you're, you're letting all my dirty secrets out here. Um, watch it. I can't remember the name of the podcast. I think it's a fairly new one. But it is mm-hmm. interesting, JP. It's interesting to watch. And I, You get a wee bit about Brennan Rogers. I mean, as a Celtic, platform, if we were doing an interview, we would focus on Lenny and Ronnie Dyla and the whole thing. It's not so much that it goes right through his career, but there's enough in there for a, a, a Celtic state of mind 
um, to be interested in as well. Listen, that's well over a, an hour now, JP. It's always an absolute pleasure. I've got to say 1,100 strong on the live stream, which is unbelievable on a Thursday afternoon. 1,100 people tuning in to listen to us two talking about Celtic. Yeah. And a wee, bit of, <laughs> a wee bit of other stuff as well on top of that. Um, I'm now taking James up to Celtic Park so he can do the interview with our new signing. That will be on the channel as soon as it comes back from Celtic. I'm looking forward to hearing what he asks uh, the, the Swedish centre-half. Thanks, everybody, for getting involved. Thanks, everybody, for getting behind us on the Sell the Jerseys initiative. And thank you to JP Mason for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind. Cheers, bro.